The chair, Ms. Banumati Narasimh Vam, distinguished invitees and speakers. Before I begin, thank you very much for that very gracious introduction. Sisters, let me begin by narrating a little story. And this story is based in Sri Lanka. Kumari de Silva is a middle-aged, middle-class woman living in the outskirts of Colombo. But despite a BA in library sciences, Kumari has not been able to earn a living because her husband does not permit her to work. Her husband, Jagat, insists that she stays at home to take care of their two children. Jagat, a somewhat controlling individual at the best of times, had become an increasingly frustrated man in middle age. He often indulges in physical violence towards Kumari and sometimes their 10-year-old son. Apart from that, he was constantly putting her down, criticizing her intelligence, her looks, her family, and her mothering skills. Because Kumari had eloped with Jagat, her parents had disowned her, and now she was too ashamed to make amends. Over the years, Jagat's constant digs on Kumari had whittled away her self-confidence, and she was now a husk of the vivacious woman that she used to be earlier on. Yet despite the risk to her very life from her husband's increasingly vicious beatings, Kumari felt that she had no other options but to endure. The portrait I just painted is of a woman lived in the midst of oppression as an opposite in opposition. But it is a life that is common to many women from many communities, cities, countries, and continents. Sisters, this afternoon I speak to you as a feminist activist and a scholar. By calling myself a feminist, I am aware that I may be sounding somewhat of a discordant note at this spiritual forum. But I believe that I need to be honest and I need to be sincere in my experience in making this speech. As a feminist, I am taking a political stand. You may think that I am speaking in a critical manner, a political perspective, than a spiritual one. And that may well be the case. However, what I'm hoping to achieve this afternoon is a blend of the spiritual and the political, the inspirational and the critical. While Kumari de Silva's life is one lived in opposition, as an opposite, perhaps due to a perceived lack of choice, feminists, on the other hand, are frequently regarded as those who position themselves as opposites and by choice. In opposition, say, to the mainstream, or perhaps we should call it the male stream, the status quo, social and uh, structures and practices, local cultures, religions, marriage, family, men, and even babies. They are often considered as being in a pain in the posterior, for the want of a better word. Always contrary, always drawing attention to themselves, always angry, moreover in public, and opposing for the sake of opposing. But as the feminist author and journalist Rebecca West put it quite plainly, if not pithily, I myself has never been able to find out precisely what feminism is. I only know that people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat. It's quite a familiar saying, and I'm sure most of you may be familiar with it. And also, as another famous feminist scholar on language, Dale Spender, argues, feminism has fought no wars, it has killed no opponents, it has set up no concentration camps, starved no enemies, practiced no cruelties. 
Its battles have been for education, for the vote, for better working conditions, for safety on the streets, for childcare, for social welfare, for rape, crisis centers, and reforms in the law. Sisters, do not fear. It is not in my intention to give you a discourse on feminism this afternoon. Rather, I want to discuss some practical and perhaps some spiritual strategies on how to be an opposite by choice and still keep your sanity. And therefore, I have more or less titled my sp speech Sailing Through Opposites, Oppositions and Oppression, Intellectual and Spiritual Strategies. Firstly then, I believe it is important to raise some ontological, if not philosophical, questions about opposites at the intellectual level. Are what we consider to be opposites really opposites? Or is it simply our perception of life, of reality? Certainly, the idea of opposites is central to a number of philosophies and religions spanning from indigenous Chinese Taoism to modern day Christianity. Opposites can be seen as construing a dualism and as, interdepend in as interdependent. In other words, there can be no female without male. There can be no light without darkness, no good without evil, and actually no opposites without similarities. Opposites can also be a unity, as suggested by the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus. Thus the tradition of tantric, tantric Hinduism, Buddhism, German mysticism, Taoism, Zen Buddhism, and Sufism sometimes reveal a oneness of matter previously thought to be different or opposite. Opposites as a unity are also found in yin and yang, in the idea of Descartes' mind and body, and Dvaita Vedanta's God and creation. Or we can look at opposites not so much as a war of oppositions, but a continuum or a spectrum of degrees of change as per the arguments of contemporary postmodernists. Consequently, we need to conceptualize opposites not as completely different or as bipolar extremes but also as constituting similarities. Thus, rationalizing on how opposites exist can make it easier to engage with and on occasion even challenge the so-called opposites. Now, at a more concrete level, how then should we convey our opposition to injustice? I'm not talking about huge public political projects. I'm talking about how we ourselves can oppose in small measures. Let me take some instances of global injustice. Arbitrarily, I must confess, from the UN World's Women Report of 2010, maternity continues to be a source of employment discrimination. Even with maternity legislation, many pregnant women still lose their jobs and complaints of maternity-related dismissals are common in courts. One of the earlier speakers this afternoon, I remember, questioned as to then whether legislation is enough. Obviously, it is not. Let me give you another example. Households of lone mothers with young children are more likely to be poorer than those of lone fathers with young children. The World Bank report of 2012 states, globally only 10 to 20 of every 100 landowners is a woman. Women account for as much as 58% of unpaid employment. And, out of, and two out of five girls are never born 
Why? Due to a preference for sons, as I think one of the earlier speakers also gave a very, very graphic example of uh, a case study of this situation. A study on sexual and gender-based violence by CARE International published in 2013 states Many countries lack the judicial resources or the political will to enforce existing laws concerning sexual and gender-based violence. The failure to prosecute and punish the perpetuation of violence has led to impunity. Now, these are some instances of injustice. Depending on our mental disposition, we may respond to injustice with distress, with anger or outrage, but maybe even indifference. Yet, if we were motivated to do something about this state of affairs, if our calling is in activism, whether social or feminist, giving way to emotion would be, a self, would be very self-defeating, in my opinion. Instead, the challenge for all of us is to cultivate a sense of equanimity or harmony when taking action. Let me give you a very simple example. I remember how when I was a young lecturer participating in a staff development program, or I came across a very experienced male trainer. The professor then gave us numerous examples from his lecture theater, but he was constantly referring to his male, uh, male uh, his undergraduate students as boys, quite affectionately, but still as boys. Despite, ha uh, despite having a number of undergraduate girl students, which I knew to be a fact. Just imagine how rejected and marginalized the girls in his class would have felt. I remember feeling very angry, so much so that I could not resist asking him quite challengingly, Professor so-and-so, do you only have main students in your class? Of course, the entire workshop burst out into laughter because everybody knew what I was getting at. But the trainer, far from being ashamed into silence that his gender prejudice had been highlighted, now began to ridicule me over and over again, calling me a feminist until the very end of the workshop. In fact, making out that feminism was a dirty word. Although the incident reflected badly on him as a trainer, at that point I had to cultivate and maintain my equilibrium. I could not afford to give in to anger or humiliation since I had provoked him to prove a political point. By resorting to a sense of composure, I managed to convey that this kind of harassment was a particular patriarchal practice and not just a personal conflict. It was important to detach myself and not to see this interaction and, and to really see this interaction in context. Moreover, this episode also taught me to expect and preempt opposition when you're into social activism. To engage with opposites then, at a personal level, we need to draw on our natural reserves of both the intellect and the spirit. I believe that practicing mental and emotional detachment as a life practice, as preached by the Buddha, as well as Hindu and Jain spiritual teachers, and of course, Guruji, uh, is one strategy to sail through opposites. Analyzing, rationalizing, and deconstructing the term opposites at an intellectual level is another. And always anticipating and preparing for opposition mentally is yet another strategy. One of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's messages for the world, I believe, is the preservation of the natural, especially when engaging with opposites to reach harmony. A message that should resonate more widely in human interest. I would like to thank Guruji and the IWC organizers for inviting me and hosting me on this occasion. It is truly a marvelous experience. 
I deeply appreciate the opportunity to speak because it has given me the chance to look within at myself, my own experiences, to collect and share my thoughts on this extremely essential topic that is not discussed as often as it should be. Thank you for sharing your ears, your eyes, and your mind.